Awesome. All right, Alex. Come on, Alex. Oh, boy. You got so it. Lots to explain this morning, yeah, people. Yeah. Almost there. Okay, you got this. You got this. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I want to say welcome to the Seattle Church of Christ Woo! North Shore. And welcome to our first live stream service that we're having right now. We are on live. That makes me feel really uncomfortable. You got this. I feel like I can say anything, and there's no time delay. I can't delete the video. This is real deal right That's here. Right. So we're going to be on our game. The second thing that I'm a little worried about today is obviously you see me limping on my way up here. And I just want to share a little bit of a story and how you can pray for me and my knee. Oh, no. Now, I thought it would be very altruistic of me to play in the Hope Basketball Tournament. Wow. Not that our team needed me, because they certainly didn't need me, but they pressured me to be a part of it. <laughs> Rudy and Grant have sending text messages out. I heard things like, if you really are the minister of our region, I know you. Yeah, that's right. And my wife said, don't do it. Right. She said, don't do it. And I did. And I heard something pop kind of during that thing. And all last week, I've been walking, and my knee will just suddenly buckle out and give away, leading to excruciating pain. Reminding me that my ACL is either torn or significantly stretched. And I just want to say thank you to Grant and Ruth. <laughs> right, there you go. There you go. I mean, really appreciate it, but I did it for Jesus. So there you go. <laughs> you know, we've been doing our series in the book of Titus, and I hope you're enjoying it. I'm certainly enjoying preaching about it. Uh, today we're going to look at a practical on leadership and how it applies to our lives and how it applies to the church. And I think you're going to be really inspired when you, when you listen to this lesson. For those of you who are younger today, I want you to not tune out the message. Because okay. you might think that this lesson is all about being an elder or an office or a role in the church of when one day you were 75 years old, <laughs> and so your attention span might want to draw thin. But what I want to say to us all today is that leadership is really valuable yeah, in okay. all ages of our lives. I mean, think about your parents and how their leadership, good and bad, can affect your lives, right? Yeah. Let's think about the world for a minute and the leadership that we value and how it always comes to the table whenever there's a crisis or an event of significance, we wonder, where is our leadership? So spiritual leadership is the same way. It's something that will guide your heart and your values. It's something that you can think about and aspire to and really desire to make your heart great, even though you're not quite there yet. Can I get an amen to that, church? That's where we are. This is about looking forward in our lives. And so I want to do some of that today. But first... I want to go over last lesson. We shared a little bit about the historical context in the book of Titus. And I don't know if you remember, but last week I shared that this book was not written to me and the Seattle Church of Christ. I mean, this was written to a group of believers thousands of years ago and to one of Paul's protégés, one of his disciples, a young man named Titus, a Greek convert to the faith, and it was written to the church in Crete. And the church in Crete had a lot of different problems, one of which included these incredible, boisterous, loud, rude, kind of rough and tough people. That's where we get the name Cretans from today. My mom would say, don't go out of the house looking like a Cretan. <laughs> now I know what it means. <laughs> Beautiful island. There we go. We also talked about the outline of the book of Titus, how at the beginning it talks about good leadership in the church, and then it transitions to right living in the church, and finally, a right living in society. 
Today, we're going to be focused on good leadership in the church. Now, the church in, in Crete had some problems, right? They're outlined here in the book of Titus. There were false teachers in the church. There were teachings about Jewish myths and controversies, genealogies. Who was your mentor? Who was your rabbi? Who were your parents? How far back to the line of Judah can you trace your roots? There was controversy in the church. There were deceivers in the church that Paul addressed. Some people in the church had a love of money. There were aesthetics in the church, and there was worldliness in the church. And Paul says, look, you've got to deal with this. Todd talked a little bit earlier in his uh, communion lesson, which was very profound and deep, where he spoke about the word servant, and God being our servant, and leaving that as the model for us to follow. That Greek word doulos means it, it, it's somebody who cares for your needs, somebody who takes care of you and waits on you. This was the idea of leadership in the first century church that Christ started. It was leaders were to be servants first and foremost. Last week, we also talked about the two kinds of good. Do you remember that? We spoke about the general word for good that is sometimes used in the Bible, the word agathos, and then we talked about the word kalos in the Bible, and how it was a deeper form of good, challenging us to reach deeper into our hearts to be most excellent and praiseworthy. This was the kind of good that the Bible talks about where it shares about things like forgiveness and holy and righteous living, and that as Christians, I mean, it's not good enough that we just let somebody in on the express lane or uh, we don't, you know, share a bad gesture with somebody that will cut us off in traffic, right? Yes. This is about doing that, but then doing more than that. This is about living the kind of life where people around you know, wow, these people clearly love God. And of course, it gives glory to God, right? We shared at the beginning of our lesson yesterday that the two concepts we were going to focus on in the book of Titus were that we were going to live in God's grace. Amen, church? Amen. That we weren't going to rely on our own power, that we weren't going to rely on our own righteousness, that we weren't going to rely on our own works, but that we were going to take God's grace in our lives and use that as an impetus to our faith to then go ahead and live for his glory. And the second theme that we talked about in this book of Titus was that we would live for God's glory. That everything we did, and that what we're building up here together, that it's not for our own glory that we're doing this, but that this is for the glory of God. And that if each of us would decide to live for the glory of God and not for our own glory, or our own desires, or our own needs and wants, and our own, you know, ambitions, but that if we can live for godly ambition, then we can truly make his glory be known in this world. And that, isn't that what God wants, right? Yeah. He wants his glory to be known. Today's lesson is all about leadership. And let's read together in Titus chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. Paul says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order, order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable. One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy messages that has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. This scripture is incredible. But when I read this, I go, oh my goodness, I can never live up to this scripture, right? <laughs> I mean, this is 
the highlight of morality in the Bible here. This is taking spiritual ambition and it's raising the bar and saying, look, you know, here's what it means to be a Christian. And then it goes, this is, look at this. This is what it means to be a leader in God's church. I mean, these characteristics, I just go, wow, who, who can inspire this? And I'm so grateful that in the church we have men and women who live this example of life who we can look at and we can use as, you know, not standing in the place of God, but we can go out. These people really do set a great example in this area. Now, a little note about the scripture. Paul here is talking about Titus about appointing elders. He goes, I want you to do this. Do this in all these little towns that we started churches. But he's going to make a couple caveats here that are in the scripture that I wanted to, to just highlight for us today. That number one, these scriptures, as we read them and break them down as exegetically, we really hold to that this role of elder and leader in the church only applies to men, okay? When you read through it, you can find that the words used are male positive pronouns, and some of the examples that Paul gives, not only in Titus and Timothy, they really only apply to men. So I, I want to throw out a little caveat here to our church if you're visiting with us and maybe watching online or something like that. Amen. Our church highly values the role and position of women in our church. Amen. Amen. We have women serve in every capacity just about in our church. Women are ushers. Women help lead songs. Women run Kids Kingdom. Women help with administration. Women do every task, pretty every ecclesiastical task that we have, except there are two roles, only two roles, that we don't have that happen in our church. And that's the role of elder and the role of evangelist, okay? Mm. Now, having said all of that, what I will say is that that can really turn some people off in today's modern era, where people go, wow, that role is limited, therefore it, it can bring a sense of, well, you must mean our worth is lower. And what I want to do today is I want to get rid of that and mark the difference between role and value. Right. The role that a person has does not have any bearing on their value no. Come on, in God's Amen. eyes. Amen. I mean, think about it for a minute. Like, because I'm not the leader of the entire church, does that mean I have less value than Darren Overstreet? No. No. If, I, if I based my value on that role, I could. And I could be left going, being very insecure and wondering, what do I do to need to do to have a higher value? But if we can erase that and just go, look, having different roles has nothing to do with our value in this world, I think it'll help us understand scripture Amen. in a better way. Amen. The world has taken these two words and said, no, they must mean the same thing. Amen. That role does equal value. But God separates those two things. And he says, we can have different roles and still have the same value in God's eyes. We can talk more about this later, but I wanted to just set that table just so all of us could understand and be on the same page about how much we value women in our church and that because we have different roles, it has nothing to do with their value in God's eyes or ours. And I'm really proud of that, and I love that. I love my wife. I'm so grateful for her role in, as a women's ministry leader helping me lead this region. I would not Amen. be able to do this without my wife. And I'm certainly grateful, and I speak on behalf of all the men here, that we are grateful for the women in our church. Amen. Amen. Now, leadership is really important. We need good leadership. I want to share a little bit of a story. This came uh, recently, there was a Delta Airlines flight where the flight was going on at 39,000 feet. And then all of a sudden, the gas mask, the air mask came out, excuse me, and the plane plummeted 30,000 feet in eight minutes. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm an engineer. And flying at 500 miles an hour at 40,000 feet in an aluminum tin box doesn't give me the best feelings in the world. I can sometimes go, this is a little bit scary. I mean, you can be on a plane and having a normal flight and something like this happens and it changes your whole day, right? I mean, these people, when the plane was descending, these people were calling their friends, they were texting loved ones. I mean, there were family, you know, it was like, I love you, I love you, you know, it was confession time on this plane right now. <laughs> people were like, oh my goodness, this could be it. Have any of you ever been on a really bumpy, crazy oh, plane ride? Yeah. Right? You know what I'm talking about? I was coming back from Boise one day on a mission trip. And as is my practice, when I sit by people, you know, when I'm boarding the plane, I introduce myself. Hey, I'm Alex, I'm a minister, what do you do? And, you know, people are like, oh, you're a minister, and they sat, you know, what's the way <laughs> And we were riding back from Boise in one of those prop planes. And I'm not kidding, we got over the Cascade Mountains, and something crazy happened. The plane started going sideways in the tail, and we were dropping, lifting, bumping, and the pilot said, hold on. <laughs> hold on? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, like, come on, pilot. Come on, man. You know what I mean? Pick a better word than that. And so we were holding on, and it was getting shaky, and the guy next to me, turns to me from the other seat because he had to reach past the rope because he chose to sit there. And he said, hey, you're a minister, right? I said, yes. He goes, could you say a prayer for us right now? I'm like, oh, now suddenly we want the minister. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I suddenly bring value to this plane ride. Because in his thinking, God surely won't let his man go down in a routine trip from Boise, Idaho. So I said, sure, I'll say a prayer. And I prayed, God, help us to discover on this trip what you would have us to discover with our lives. Amen. He didn't like that prayer. But... <laughs> and then like 10, 15 minutes later, it sort of bubbled out. and He went back to reading his book, and life was good again. But isn't it crazy how when we have crisis and a moment of trouble, then all of a sudden we want leadership yep. and spiritual leadership, right? Yeah. It's the same way with the church. I mean, we don't think about it until there's a crisis. We don't really, I mean, most of the time, we don't even care who the pilot is on the plane. When something like this happens, when you get off the plane and you shake that pilot's hand, you're like, you did a great job not destroying us today. Thank you. you know? <laughs> so fired up about it. Um, worldly leadership is so different than spiritual leadership. Worldly leadership, the results outweigh the means. Strong and decisive. The leader's opinions matter more than anyone else's. Moral standards don't apply to you. Focus is on self and self-accomplishment. That's what the world says for leadership. This is what it means. Be stubborn. Be strong. You do that, you're going to be the greatest leader ever, right? Spiritual leadership, completely different. As Todd shared about in this communion today, in spiritual leadership, how we do things matters more than the final outcome. It can be strong, but it's a collaborative and decisive process. Spiritual leaders value the opinions of others. A higher moral standard actually applies to spiritual leaders than not in the Bible. And of course, the focus is not on our accomplishments, but on Christ and his work in our church. You know, what we just talked about in leadership today, and we're, we're talking a little bit about the eldership, and I want us to take a step out here and think about this. What if we apply this leadership to the world? What if we just took it to politicians and we held the tightest standard for what it means to be an elder for our politicians? 
Well, first of all, how many of them would even qualify, right? Yeah. But second of all, what do you think that would do to our country and our nation? It would completely turn it on its end. So I want to talk about some of these words in spiritual leadership. Let's dig down a little deeper. Amen, church? Amen. The appointment of elders was so vital to the church that Paul says, look, you've got to figure this out. Take care of it. I'm even leaving you here because this is so important. Um, Garfield, James A. Garfield, President of the United States, actually said this. He was an elder in the Christian church when he resigned from that position to take his presidency. He said, I resign the highest office in the land to become president of the United States. That's what he felt about spiritual leadership. This is huge in what we see. And here we go. Spiritual leadership, blameless, above reproach, no shame on the church. The idea was that somebody wouldn't be accused of wrongdoing or crime. And it's used twice in scripture. Why? It's so that the elder doesn't bring shame or a bad reputation into his church or in the family. Now, it doesn't mean perfectly righteous, okay? That's not what it means, but it does mean to live a blameless life. life. Faithful to his wife. The Greek wording here literally means he's a one-woman man, a husband who is faithful in his covenant of marriage. Children who believe and are not wild or disobedient. The Greek word here is the Greek word pistos, which means faithful and trustworthy, that they show respect and are obviously led by his guidance and direction. They're not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient or debaucherous. That he's not overbearing, meaning that he's not obstinate or stubborn. Literally, it means somebody who's not trying to place himself and his will at the expense of others. He has the best interest of the group and the best interest of people when he makes his decisions. He's not quick-tempered, isn't given in to angry outbursts, and is not easily offended. Is not given in to drunkenness, meaning there's not a reliance on alcohol in the elders in the elders' life. A lot of times people go, Well, I'm not an alcoholic, but yet they use alcohol to help their emotions feelings to calm down, to pick them up, to make them happy, that wouldn't qualify here as a disqualifier in this area, because that's not what an elder does. He's not violent, meaning, is he pushy, defensive, or quarrelsome? Not pursuing dishonest gain. He's not doing anything illegal or improper. Is he hospitable, meaning does he care for strangers? Does he love what is good? Is he focused on the side of truth and impartial, impartial to the truth and to virtue? Self-control, does he live a healthy, clear, and disciplined life? And is he a healthy, clear, and disciplined thinker? Is he upright, innocent, not being open to being accused of impropriety, that his life is in line with the witness of his word? Holy in his devotion to God's law and his nature, and his boundaries in his personal life, is he holy? Is he disciplined? Meaning, does he gain self-discipline in his life and how he lives his faith? Or does he need other people to discipline him and train him in that area? This is such a great task for all of us. Can we all look at our lives and, and say that, especially young people? Where's your discipline? Where, you know, parents are always hitting that up with their kids, right? Or at least I do, because I was in the army. <laughs> Trustworthy message. Can he uphold Jesus' teaching and refute those who, hold, who, who go against it? This is a picture of a man, not a perfection. This is a picture of a person, not a perfection of a person. What I mean by this is this. What these are is these are explaining qualities that describe the person, not a 
qualification that makes the person disqualified, right? Or do they? This is where I want to share openly about my own exegetical journey in this, okay? I used to believe that the eldership was about a qualification. That these were things that you somehow were qualified for, and you could be disqualified if you didn't meet the right standard of, and, and not that these reflected qualities in a person's life and qualities that they had. And so what happens when you do that, I'm going to want to take the example, the biggest, biggest example that we have in our church, and that's believing children. Okay? If these are qualifications, then in order to be an elder, here's what needs to happen. All of your children must be faithful disciples of Jesus. Believe. So if you have six children, and one of them's three, and the others are all teenagers and faithful, then you would be disqualified from the eldership because your youngest child was not yet a Christian. Okay? See where this is going? Now, if these were also qualifications, then let's say one of your children eventually decided, well, the faith isn't for me, and they turned away from the Lord, then instantly you would become disqualified for this position. So now what you're saying is they all need to be faithful. They can't leave the faith. Oh, and what about if somebody has only one child or no children at all? Well, then it, they're completely out of it because it says whose children, plural, are in this area. This was the scientific way that I used to approach this scripture, okay? Because I'm an engineer, and so I like science. I like it when things match up, and F equals MA. I love it when the equal sign is clear. I so enjoy it as an engineer. But spiritually, I can't practice my faith that way, because it draws all kinds of conclusions, and it can really be hurtful. And what I mean by that is this. If we go scientific in this area, then it makes the role of a parent responsible for the faith of their kids as opposed to influential in the faith of their kids, okay? Let me say this in, a, in another way. Teens, right now, I want you to raise your hand if you believe that your parents are responsible for you becoming a Christian or not. Right, okay. That's all right. Okay, teens, raise your hand if you believe your parents have zero Influence on you become a Christian now. David. All right. Okay. Now, raise your hands if you think your parents have some influence in your life and what you do, but they're not the only determining factor or the main one. Okay. Great. Those represent just different ways we can look at the scriptures. We can look at our faith in this area and go, well, parents have no responsibility in it which I don't think is true. I think that's why this qualification exists for the eldership. These qualities, excuse me, exist because I, I think it is important how our parenting goes and how our life goes. And I think there's a lot we can learn about a person from their kids. You can learn a lot about me from my children. You can see some of our mistakes, some of my strengths, and some of my weaknesses. To certainly take my kids and say they have absolutely zero bearing on my life and my faith. That, 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 that's, I think, over here. But then if you took my kids and say, they are 100% a product of what I do, well, that can really be unhealthy for them and for me. If we took that same logic in the church, think about it. What we'd almost be saying is that if anyone leaves the church, it's the elder's responsibility. And we don't want to do that here. What we want to come after is what is the original intent of this scripture? Remember we talked about exegesis? What is the meaning? What does God want us to hold from this? And I think what God wants us to hold from this is this. Is that if these are qualities that we are to have and that our elders to have, then yes, there is an influence that they have on their kids and on their children. However, it's not the only factor in their kids' faith. I want to read this. 
by John Oakes. He says, and kind of trying to, to sum this up, John Oakes is a, a teacher, a, a PhD and scholar, Christian scholar who, who wrote a book about this, and he says, without a doubt, the quality of a man's parenting as it is reflected in the lives of his children is a key aspect for those who would take on the role of an elder, which is why this quality appears prominently in both Titus and 1 Timothy. If we are looking at the quality of faithfulness of the candidate's children, then it seems at least one or two of the children should be old enough for the fruit of the management of the home to be borne out. However, does this mean that one would have to have all the children past the age of accountability to nail it down and get it right? Not really. Let us summarize by creating the picture of the man. Okay? And that's what we're talking about here. The picture of the man. The picture of the man of God is one who is willing and well prepared to take on the role of elder, pastor, overseer in the church. He is not a man who is perfect, but a man about whom no seriously damaging charge could be laid. Anyone that knows this man would agree that no one could believe he would use his position for financial gain. His children are not perfect, but it's reasonable to think that based on what we can see, that they are stable enough, that they show him enough respect, that he will be able to focus a great deal of attention on the family of God. There is not even the slightest hint of sexual impropriety in this brother's life. Perhaps more importantly, Sisters feel loved, protected, and safe around him. No one is on pins and needles, wondering if he'll get angry or defensive. If one quality could describe this man, it's unselfish love. He's not given to arguing, but to peacemaking, and bringing about unity and consensus. This man provides qualities which are not often found together in one person. While being gentle and peace-loving, he is able to respond vigorously whenever the church and the truth of the gospel are under attack. He knows his Bible backward and forward and knows how to apply it to provide milk for the new convert and solid food for the mature, all the while opposing those who would bring trouble and shame on the kingdom of God. That is an amazing summation of how God views the eldership. And what I'd like to do here today is not just to lift up our elders, but I want to lift up everyone in our church that though not every disciple can be an elder, we should all be aspiring to live this way in our lives. Right, church? Yeah. I mean, this is the level of life that mature men want to live. I mean, when I think about my life 40 years from now, man, I want it to be said this about me. Yeah. I want people to say, wow, he was faithful to his wife and faithful to the church. I want people to be able to look at my kids and hopefully see that faith being renewed in their lives and in their parenting. I want people to say, wow, man, he is inspired to be a peacemaker. He was approachable and comforting. And man, he defended the gospel and truth backwards and forwards. I mean, these are all of our qualities here today. So what I think we've done in the past is we maybe made elder be a position that's so high and so unattainable that so many of us thought there is no way we could possibly achieve all of this. I might as well give up. And yet, if we think about these as qualities in our lives, these are things that we can all decide that we want to live for. I really do love my relationship with the elders here. I want to finish it off by kind of sharing why these things are in here. This is in here in the Bible, number one, so that our eldership and our leadership in our church would live above reproach, as it talks about in Titus chapter 1. Excuse me. Number two, that there's safety and protection for the Christians in the church. That that way we have a way that we can administer church discipline and lead the church while people in the congregation feel safe and that, that there's a, a warm and a gentle and a safe place for them to practice out their faith and be disciplined. 
And lastly, that the church is protected, that our doctrine, our beliefs, our values, our culture, that those areas get protected in the leadership of the church. And so when we put all that together, it, it kind of reminds me of this quote. It says, the pastor must speak in two voices, one for gathering the sheep and one for driving away wolves and thieves. I really see this as being what a true elder and what a man of God is like, right? That they have this gentleness when it comes to working with people, but also a ferocity and a, a really bearing down on the truth. I know a lot of us can really err more on the side of being gentle and loving and caring and kind, but you know, can we aspire to also have some teeth in the gospel and teeth when it comes to the truth? Absolutely. They're both needed. You know, I have Martin Luther King Jr. up here in some of these slides because I think he represents great spiritual leadership. Um, even though his primary leadership started in the church, it turned out that his primary leadership ended up in the world, helping bring civil rights and that revolution to our country, which we badly needed at that time. Leadership in God's church reflects his glory, and that's true. Our leadership in our church reflects God's glory, and I love the leadership in our church. I can't tell you how grateful I am for Paul, Paul Martin. Uh, Paul is just a gentle, loving, encouraging guy. He's so easy to work with. I mean, changes and things like that. He's, he's just really flexible, and whenever I confess sin to him, we get together, I mean, he never overreacts. He's just, he's just such a wonderful person to work with. And yet, I know when it comes to defending the gospel and defending culture and the things that truly matter, he is right on there, stepping up, ready to, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone that would oppose what is true. And that's a beautiful thing, you know? What I'd like to see happen is this. We can't all be elders, but we can strive and strive to have these qualities in our life. In our life. And I hope that today this inspired you. I hope that as we looked at what spiritual leadership is, and we looked at these qualities, and we looked at these pictures, that what you decided to do was go, you know what? This is how I want to live in my life. Amen. We've got to stop being people who are being content and being mediocre, mediocre in our spirituality. But we've got to be people that are determined to strive for the greatest and highest offices that God would have. And I think that is leadership in his church. For God's grace and for his glory.